Testing for Mark. Test, test, test. Good morning. Welcome back. This is number eight of 12 for two thirds of the way through the course as of today. Uh, we have a few announcements. We have posted the schedule for the rest of the workshops. So if you didn't see that, please go look on Blackboard or Slack. We posted it in both spots. The way it's going to work, this is week eight right now. We have two more workshops. So. Next week, sort of starting Thursday in that cycle, and then the following Thursday in that cycle, that's two more topics, two more things to learn. And then we have the dry run of the lab exam, where we're going to give you something like the lab exam, and you will have the whole workshop to work on it, and you'll be able to talk to the TAs and try and figure out what you don't know, and give yourself an idea of how it's going to work. The week following that is week 11. That week will be your actual lab exam. That is worth 15% of your final grade. Week 12, we will have a bit of a review and we will do the outtake test the same as you did in week one. So that's just that, that same statistical knowledge test that you did. You'll do it again and see how much you've learned. And that will wrap up the workshops. In terms of the actual material for the course, we are on chapter 3.2 today. We expect to finish chapter 3 in the next two weeks. So we will finish chapter three by the end of week 10, probably, maybe a little bit of spillover into week 11, which gives us a lecture, a lecture and a half to do some review, to do some recap, to kind of frame the whole course and to get you set up for your final exam. Final exam has been scheduled. If you haven't bothered to look at your schedule yet, it is on the 15th of December at two o'clock in the afternoon. And we have two rooms available. We will be in here and the gym, if I remember correctly. We're, we're in a large lecture theater plus the gym. We will announce which one you are supposed to go to closer to that date because we haven't quite figured out exactly how we're going to break down the sections yet. This section and section B, Michelle's section, are writing the same exam. So technically, it doesn't really matter what room you go to because it'll be the same paper and the same writing, and we're marking it together. So that doesn't matter. What matters is that there's a limited number of seats. If too many people show up here, then we have to send them over to the gym and that's a 12 minute walk. And so, you know, you don't want to be late for your exam because you came to the wrong room and there was an overflow. So we're going to set it up probably based on last names. We'll take the entire course, all 600 of you, sort it alphabetically and everybody A through P will be in the gym and everybody Q through Z will be here or something like that. We'll announce that though, we'll put it very clearly on Blackboard, we'll send you an email like around the 12th just to remind you of just exactly how it works. You are allowed to bring a hand calculator to the exam. There's a lot of computations in this course, calculators are kind of expected. So please feel free to bring any calculator, we don't mind what. Um, if you bring a TI series, I don't mind. But just be aware that at any time somebody could stop you and ask to look at it to make sure you haven't like recorded little notes in it or something like that. But if you're comfortable with your TI-83 from high school and you really want to use it, that's fine. I did the same thing when I was your age. I loved it. I got used to it in high school and I just wanted to use it some more. Any questions about the course, about the organization, about anything? Life, the universe. No, the assignments will keep running kind of at least to week 11. 
um, because depending on how we shake it out, we'll probably want to do a bit of a review assignment as well. Uh, we'll kind of make that determination as to how the assignments stop based on where the schedule stops. The semester is weird, right? Because it starts on a Thursday and ends on a Wednesday. So we will probably just stop them so that there's a bit of a break there at the end. Also, because this assignment, people in section B have been struggling with it. It's, it's strange, it's the same assignment as last week and it's the same formula as just like with today's modifications, but they've really been struggling with it. So Michelle emailed me last night and asked if I wanted to and I said, sure, we're gonna extend today's, uh, this week's assignment to be due on Monday. So it's not due Friday, it's due Monday, but we're gonna post the next assignment on Friday and then it'll be due the Monday again. So we're gonna overlap them a bit. So if you're done as of Friday, you can start the next assignment. If you're not, Keep going until Monday, and then you'll still have a full week to do the other assignment. That gives you a little bit more time this weekend just to make sure that you have the time to think about it and get it done. But we will, we're trying to do as many assignments as possible to give you as many opportunities as possible to make up for any bad scores that you've received, any missed assignments that you've received. I posted the grades. Uh, I got some great feedback from people. This isn't right. This isn't right. I've fixed everything except for... Um, one offset thing, which was because the TAs gave the people the wrong quiz word of the day. And I've got a couple of those I have to backlog and fill. But if there's anything else wrong with your grades, please let me know. This is not a formal grade. It's not being reported to anybody but you. But I need to fix it now because the formulas as I have them right now are what I'm going to use at the end of the semester. So if there's something wrong, I want to finish it now. Not you contact me in February asking why your grade was what it was and then we have to go back and do a formal grade change request and all these things. Get it fixed now if you can, please. It takes five minutes to just quickly check your grades. I don't remember the exact dates I posted it. It's on Slack, it's on Blackboard, just look. I'm, uh, Dr. Boo made up those dates. I am assuming they are correct and they are the actual weeks. Um, if she offset them by something, I will fix that. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's, that's how it should be, right? Because you write it in your workshop. And the people who have Thursday workshops, which is most of you, started your workshop very first day of term. And then every Thursday since, you've had a workshop. So your lab exam will be on the 11th such Thursday. And then the 12th one, you'll write, rewrite that knowledge exam, and then you don't have one in the final week of term because the term ends on a Wednesday. So you don't have that final Thursday or anything like that. So everything's kind of all offset for our course. But basically, the 11th workshop that you attend will be your formal written lab exam worth the big chunk of your grade. The 10th workshop you attend will be your dry run, your chance to kind of try things, see how it works, get a sense of whether you actually know what you're doing, freak out, begin studying frantically for the following week. You know, whatever you need to do is fine. All right, let's get started on lecture eight. Today is chapter 3.2 in the text. Sorry. And it is an extension of last week's idea. So last week we talked about hypothesis tests for single proportions, and we did the formal theory behind them. We had already seen these ideas from chapter two. It was just a matter of introducing the formal framework for doing standard error and computing these things from start to finish instead of using the permutation tests via simulation. This week is the same thing, except we are talking about differences in two proportions. So now we have two sets of proportions, and we're going to talk about whether or not they're different. That's the whole chapter. So that's the next two hours. So here's a question to get us started. As with every chapter in this text, we are starting with motivating examples. Scientists predict that global warming may have big effects on the polar regions within the next 100 years. In fact, we're already seeing that happen with the calving off of very large icebergs and the melting of the very various polar caps. One of the possible effects is that the northern ice cap may completely melt, giving us a true year-round northern passage, which was the, the historical dream. If you know your history of, the, of North American settlement, one of the things that was the goal, one of the objectives they had was to try and find a northern passage. That is a waterway that would allow you to go from Western Europe to China and India straight across instead of going down all the way to the bottom of South America and around the Cape and then back up, which the Cape is also one of the worst weather areas in the world and brutal seas and they were doing these in old school sailing ships. So they wanted to just be able to sail right across. 
and many people tried and failed and died because there's a lot of ice between Europe and China. And so that could technically, and they, they think this could happen in the next 10 years, we could have a summer clear northern passage, which would allow transport ships, you know, the big carriers, to actually just go across from northern Europe straight across the pole to China and India, or vice versa. And that would actually be incredibly fast. It would cut the time by more than 50%. But it requires that there be no ice. And it's also a bad thing, uh, because where does that ice go? It turns into water. And the water goes into the ocean, and the ocean goes like a bathtub, and then New York is underwater. And so is large areas of the U.S. East Coast and the U.S. West Coast, and most of the Pacific Islands are gone, and so on. Melting polar ice caps is a big deal. So would this bother you a great deal, some, a little, or not at all? Well, from the perspective of where we live, we're fine. We live well above sea level, well inland. It's not really going to affect Peterborough in a huge way, or Ontario, really, for that matter. But would it bother you? Probably. Yes. So it should bother you a great deal if you are at all a reasonable person. Whether or not you believe it's anthropogenic, that is to say human-caused, it's still not something you want to see happen. The last time the poles fully melted, the sea levels were over 20 feet higher than they currently are. That's most of the eastern seaboard gone all the way to the Appalachian Mountains. That's not a good thing. That's several quadrillion dollars worth of real estate and houses and industries gone. So, the General Social Survey from last year, or last week, sorry. Remember, this is the US thing. They ask this question every once in a while, every five years, and they, they use it as a way of, of deciding whether or not uh, societal opinions have changed. So, it asked the same question. This is the 2010, and so 454 out of 680 people said that this bothered them a great deal. The same thing was done at Duke University in North Carolina. And they asked a bunch of first years the same question just to kind of see what happened. So they went out with clipboards. They asked 105 first year Duke students the same question. And they had 69 of those 105 say that it would bother them a great deal. So the question is, if we were trying to estimate something from this, our parameter of interest is the difference between the proportions of Duke students and the proportion of all Americans who would be bothered a great deal. And so we're looking at the difference, because you have two different numbers. And the difference lets us evaluate whether or not they are actually, get this, different or the same. And so that will be the parameter that we are trying to estimate. Remember, the parameters are the underlying truths of the universe, the thing that it is theoretically possible to find, but it is prohibitively expensive. We can't actually go and ask all 340 million Americans what they think about this. Or we could ask all the Duke students, even if it would be expensive, because there's not that many of them. But we can't find this true difference. But it does exist, and we want to estimate it. The point estimate, remember, that's the, that's the guess. That's the educated guess. This course could be renamed from Statistics 1, Non-Calculus Statistics, to Educated Guessing. Because really what we're doing here, we're trying to do careful, scientifically valid guessing. And we are going to guess the difference between the proportions by using the proportions of our sampled Duke students and our sampled Americans who would be bothered. And these are where we get our hats. So just as a reminder, anytime you see the hats, that means we're talking about a sample. And there was a lot of confusion in last week's assignment, which does not seem to be terribly well-founded in that People like literally missed the entire point of last week's lecture, which was that sometimes you put in P hat and sometimes you put in P naught. And I was getting questions where people weren't even aware that that was a distinction. So the same thing applies this week. You have to be careful what you put in to the standard error formula. All of the details will then be the same in terms of the inference. It's exactly the same as last week. We are using a Z test. Our numerator has a value. We have a standard error on the bottom. Once we have the Z, we can compute as a P value, and we're done the problem. But as I, as I indicated several times last week and the week before, the big thing about this course is that while it is the same procedure over and over and over again, the standard error changes. 
based on the context, the denominator of this formula will be a different value which is computed differently. It's the same framework and the same setup, but the denominator value is computed in a different way. So if we wanted to do a confidence interval, the exact same rationale applies. It's still the point estimate that you obtain, plus or minus your margin of error. And this week's assignment is really all about this, these two ideas. And the hypothesis test is exactly the same again. The big thing is this margin of error is Z star multiplied by the standard error. So notice the standard error shows up here, the standard error shows up here, and the standard error is not the same as the standard error from last week. And distinguishing between these different standard errors is really the entire point of this progression in the course. And the start of next course as well. For those of you going on to 1052, most of chapter 4 is exactly the same idea, but with different parameters and setups and contexts. But it's the same formula, the same setup, all the way through chapter 4. So we have to estimate this. Now, the way I've written this in this set of notes is I've started using subscripts. And I used this a little bit last week, but I'm doing it again for the standard error, just to keep track of which one I'm talking about. So this is the standard error of the difference between the estimated values. So it's p hat Duke minus, minus p hat USA. It's the standard error associated with those. And you, you know, labeling this, while it is a bit tedious to write it all out, it does help you keep track of what's going on. This is the standard formula for the standard error of the difference between two sample proportions. So it is again a square root, which is one of the more arithmetically challenging things to get correct. So you have to be careful with these square roots because you can take the square root of part of it, not all of it. And we have the proportion of the first set times the one minus p from the first set over the number of samples in the first set plus the proportion in the second set times one minus p of the second set over the number of the second set. Each of these is essentially last week, individually. And that's because each of those is an estimate of the variance of a single proportion. And so what we're doing is we're taking the variances of the two different sets, we're adding them together, and then we're taking the square root of the result. And that's going to give us our estimate of the standard error of this estimator. Now, what do we need to make this true? So for confidence interval, remember there's always conditions for confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. So here they are for this type of problem. Conditions for the confidence interval when doing differences of proportions. Number one, you have to have independence within the individual groups. So if I did the dividing line of this alleyway up the class, and I sampled from you folks, and I sampled from you folks, I would need to, in those two different groups, make sure I sampled randomly here and randomly here. So if I sampled randomly from you folks, but then I said front three rows, I would fail that condition. Because you're random, but this group has a convenience sample which is not random, and maybe the people in the front have different opinions to the people at the back. And so you have to be careful. Both groups must be sampled from randomly or the confidence interval conditions fail. So in addition, we need that the samples are both less than 10% of their total populations. That's the 10% rule that we talked about last chapter and again last week. So we have to have both of these be less than 10%. Uh, number in Duke was 105, so this was 105 which is definitely less than 10% of the students at Duke. I mean, it's a small school, but it's not that small. It's actually, it's actually a fairly big school. It's bigger than Trent. So 105 is totally fine. And 680 is definitely less than 10% of 340 million. So we're good there. So that condition is also met. So we also need to assume that the attitudes are independent, and that's kind of, most of the time you have that for free. You sample randomly, but if your attitudes are somehow dependent upon the people, that can be an issue. But, you know, opinions are mostly, while we are influenced by culture, we just kind of assume that the opinions are random, and that's okay. So these are independent of each other, and so that's the condition we needed. And then we need 
that the groups are independent. Not that just within the groups, but also the groups themselves are independent of one another. And so this would be a case of, say, I randomly sample from the whole class, and then I randomly sample from you folks over here on the left side. That's a problem. Those groups are not independent because you are part of the whole. Now, anybody see a problem with that? Presumably, Duke students live in America, given that Duke is in America. So Duke students are part of all Americans. So are they then an independent group? Technically, no. Technically, Duke is part of America, which is part of the whole of America, and so those two groups are not independent. However, because of the way we randomly sampled, and the GSS was ran in 2010, and this is sampled a few years later, it is highly unlikely that any of these students were actually part of that GSS survey. And so we can assume that it's OK. There's no overlap between the groups, so we proceed even though the Duke students are actually Americans, just like the Americans that were sampled. So a lot of the times you get away with some vigorous hand-waving here. You don't have to be too, too careful about it. You just got to stop and think just for a minute, is there anything really obvious I need to worry about? And if you're not, then you're OK. And remember the rule for confidence interval testing. We need to observe at least 10 successes and 10 failures in the groups. But that here, we have two groups. So we need both the Americans from the GSS and the Duke students from the survey to both be at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. Now, if I go back, or you just kind of remember the thing, we're actually fine there. In the case of the GSS, these are our failures, and these are our success. And all four of these numbers are larger than 10, which means we have number three fine, as I said, we were going to assume number two and number one we have, and that works out great because we did sample randomly. So what we've done here is we've amalgamated all of the cases of the not a great deal. You see that? There were four categories in the original slide. And now we only have two because what we were asking is whether the proportion that selected a great deal is the same, which means all the other cases are kind of irrelevant. They're just the other, the flip. So we convert it into a binary so we can do a proportion. And now we have not a great deal, which is you know, the medium level and the, the small amount and not at all. You know, I, like, I like sticking my head in the sand. All of those options are merged together into just not a great deal. We now have a setup like all of the questions on this week's assignment. You're given a little table or a little set of data where you have a couple of proportions and then you're asked to do the test. So let's do the test on this. These are now our proportions. So what we've done is we've taken 454 and we've divided it by 680 and we've taken 69 over 105 and we get the other proportion. So we now have two proportions, 657 and 668. So both around 66%. So they're fairly close. The question is whether these are enough different to be statistical in their difference. And that we can't do just by the naked eye. You look at it and you're like, honestly, they look pretty close, right? But can we tell the difference? And most of you are first year, so you're a long way off from your thesis projects. But you'd be amazed at how similar two things can be and still be statistically different when you're doing a thesis project and you're desperate to just finish the thing. And then you get it and you're like, oh, it is different, even though they're different on the fourth decimal. And then you write it up and you are done and you graduate and go off and hopefully have a wonderful life. All right, this is our formula. Expand it out. We take our estimate of our Difference in proportions, p hat 1 minus p hat 2. And we take our estimate of the standard error. Now, I made a typo here. What am I missing? Missing z star. So please put that in. Notice, however, that this is not the formula I gave you four slides ago. Question, yes? In here? Yeah. Sorry, I, I just pointed at my screen, which means nothing to you. In here? Yeah. Yes. Because when you are combining variances, you always add. Oh. 
And so when we're doing this in this formula for combining these things inside the square root, it is an addition, even though it's a difference in proportions. And the reason is, if you, if you just stop and think about it for a minute, variance is kind of like a confidence interval. You've got a center point and you've got a variance around it. And then you've got another point and a variance around it. If you allow those to subtract, you're essentially forcing yourself to be between the two points. But there's nothing stopping you from being on the upper end of this distribution and the lower end of this distribution, which is even further away. And so you always add variances. And so in this case, that's what we're doing. We are adding the variances. Now, what changed from my previous formula? What's different here? Anybody see it? No, I mean, the, the, this part's fine. This was my point estimate. I'm not talking about the formula from last week. I just mean the theoretical formulas from five slides ago. P hat. Where, where did I put P hat in? Inside the standard error formula. If you look back on your slides or on what you wrote down, the formula for standard error I gave you was just like the formula from last week. It had P's in it. And we don't know P. So we make the same assumption we made last week, which is that we can use P hat and put it in there. And you will notice that I have specified which p hat I'm putting in. The first one is a block which is associated with the first proportion. So this, this is proportion 1. And this is proportion 2. So when you're doing a confidence interval, you use both sets of data, both proportions, and both number ends to make the formula. So. This is about half of the assignment, is using this formula over and over again. So just make sure you understand the details of how to put it together. Let's put some numbers in. So this time I remembered to put my Z star, which is good. So I put in P hat Duke, which was 66.8%. I subtract the P hat from the GSS, which was 65.7%. And then I have Z star, and I'm just doing a 95%. So that's what this is. This is a 95% Z star. And I could find that. Remember last week we talked about this. Q norm of 0.975, which is the center 95% plus the lower tail 2.5% because Q norm works all the way to the left. And then I have my square root for my standard error. And I start putting things in. I have 668 and 332 and 680. And 657, did I do that right? Or did I make a massive typo? I have the Duke bit right, but I, I flipped the denominators. I'm sorry. This is 105, and this is 680. There we go. And now I should probably check that number and make sure that it's actually correct. So 0 0.668 times 0 0.332 divided by 105 plus 0.657 times 0.343 divided by 680, and then I take the square root of that answer, and that answer was correct to the last digit. So it's 0 0.0494, not 497. And then when I multiply that by 1.96, and I do 0 0.011 plus 1 1.96 times 0 0.0 494, I get 108 again, so that's okay, and 0 0.011 minus 1 1.96 times 0 0.0494 and negative 086. So everything's okay there. Question, yes? Let's draw another picture. Anytime you're dealing with Z stars or confidence intervals, the question is why is that associated with 95%? And there are basically three numbers that you can memorize if you want. And the numbers are 1.645 is a 90%, 1.96 is a 95%, and 2.58 is a 99%. But the assignment likes to mess, up, mess with you and actually give you these like round off things like 96.2% confidence interval, just to make you actually do the work and not just regurgitate the memorized thing. Draw a picture. It's always drawing a picture. Identify your center. Now, we are doing a confidence interval, which means two tails, and we want 95% in the middle. So we do these, 
That's 95% in the middle. That's Z star. That's minus Z star. Solve. And we gave you an entire assignment on questions like this to try and get you to the point where you could actually figure out how to do these things. The, what happens, though, the easy way is because we know that it's the middle area here and it's symmetric, that means this is half of what's left. This is also half of what's left. The sum is now 1. 95 plus 2.5 plus 2.5 is 100. And that means that I can find this area by calling Q norm of 0.975. Those two are the same. Because Q norm takes the area to the left of your unknown thing and gives you back what that unknown thing was. So if any of you have your laptops open, you are, I'll pop open R quick, you can do Q norm of 0.975 and you will get exactly 1.96. Rounded. It's 1.959964. 1.96. So that's how you do these problems. Pardon me? Because 0.975 is 0.95 plus 0 0.025. It's the green area. The area to the left of your unknown Z star is blah. Fill that in. Q norm tells you what the Z star is. So you could do this for any question on the assignment or any confidence level. You start and you identify, you do this exact same picture. You just change the numbers in there. So you put this number in here as whatever the question gives you. 95%, 96.1%, 97%, whatever it tells you your confidence level is. It goes in there. And then it's symmetric. So you take 1 minus that, divide it by 2, and put it into the tails. And then the green area goes into Q norm and tells you the value of Z star. Essentially, every problem on the assignment requires you to do this over and over and over again. And last assignment requires you to do this over and over and over again. And I am hoping that maybe it will sink in by the final exam, because it is sort of an important idea. Any other questions about what I've done so far? Yes? Does the order matter, you mean? So the question is, does the order of the difference matter? Not particularly. It, it's based on the, the word problem that you're given. If it's asking whether one is bigger than the other, then you can actually still do it both ways. It just changes which tail you're talking about for your alternative hypothesis. So we're going to see some more examples of this. But basically, for this example, because it is a two-tailed example and we're just asking if they're different, the order is arbitrary. And you can, you can flip it around as much as you want. Just don't do what I did and put the wrong denominators on the, on the different pieces, because that does matter. Yes, question. Sorry, I don't think you can do this, but um, would you give an example of the confidence interval was 92%? 92? Yeah, absolutely. So if we had a 92% confidence interval, draw the picture, put the center, Label Z star, make it a new, make it a power, not a uh, subscript. Label negative Z star, put in what you know. What's left? Let's switch colors. What's 100 minus 92? 8 over 2 is? And what is the area to the left of Z star? We have Q norm of 0 0.92 plus 0 0.04. And if you did that, you will get a different Z star than the Z star that you found before. And it will be between 1.645 and uh, and 1.96, sorry. And you can actually compute that in R, and it'll give it to you. Help? 
Any other questions about this? It's a really important idea that some people just aren't clicking on. So just make sure you get your head around this. Question? OK, so let's just pop back up to the actual question we were working on. So this was our proportion stuff. This is our just little example. Here's this. Where did these come from? Is that the question? Yeah. OK, so at this point, you just stop and use your calculator. You have 0 0.011 plus 1.96 times 0 0.0494. That is one number. Write it down. You have 0 0.011 minus 1.96 times 0 0.0494. That is a second number. These numbers will be not the same. The smaller one goes on the left. The larger one goes on the right. Put brackets around them, and that's your confidence interval. And that's really all there is to it. Like it once you get to the point where you write down this filled-in version, everything from there is math. Just get your calculator and do it, or use R and do it. And I actually, I do strongly encourage you to kind of get comfortable with R that way. You know, you can do the whole assignment by having an R window open and kind of just working through the formulas in R. That way, if you make a mistake, it's really easy to quickly edit whichever one was wrong and keep going instead of typing it all into your calculator again. So this is our confidence interval. So this says that we are 95% confident that the difference between the two is between negative 0.086 and positive 0.108. What is the conclusion of our test in that situation? If we were doing a hypothesis test, what would be the conclusion? Do you remember the rule for confidence intervals translating? If the confidence interval overlaps the null, you will fail to reject. In other words, we do not have a statistically significant difference between them here because we include zero in this interval. So looking at this interval, does everyone have a good like mental picture of what it looks like? It's an interval. It's not just two numbers. It's actually all the numbers between those two numbers. So draw a number line, locate zero, locate the left point, uh, what do they have? Sorry. This is our confidence interval. This whole region in here. That region includes zero. Which means you include the null hypothesis, which means you fail to reject the null hypothesis. That's how you translate that back to the hypothesis test framework. Even though, technically, we haven't even stated our hypotheses here. Well, if you did, and then you did the confidence interval, this would be how they would relate. So let's do that. Which would be the proper set of hypotheses for testing if the proportion of Duke students who would be bothered a great deal by the melting of the northern ice cap differs from the proportion who feel the same? So it's testing if this differs from that. So one or two tailed. Do you see greater, bigger, lesser, smaller, tinier? No. All we see is differ, not the same. So our alternative hypothesis is going to be a not equal then. So it's a two tailed test. All right. Which ones of these, if any, are correct? What do you think? Both one and three are actually correct because they're saying exactly the same thing. Remember, null and alternative hypotheses are stated about the parameters. There are never any hats 
in a null or an alternative hypothesis. So we scratch off the ones here and here because they have hats. And these things are the same because if these two things are equal, that's what you're testing, then the difference between them is zero. And if these two things are not equal, then the difference between them is not zero. It's just an alternative way of saying exactly the same thing. For the purposes of this course, we're going to just, by default, always go with this guy. There's no real reason for it. It's just slightly easier to write. But if you write the other one, it's not wrong. We will not mark you wrong. It is the same statement. In the first one, you're saying they are the same. In the second one, you're saying the difference between them is zero. That's just a different way of saying the same thing. OK, connect it back to the one proportion case for confidence intervals. When constructing a confidence interval for a population proportion, we checked the observed numbers of successes and failures were 10. That was the rule that we had and that what we needed. This was from last week. And when doing a hypothesis test for the same thing, we wanted the expected number, which was based on the null hypothesis. And that was, again, we went over that last week. So let's do the same thing this week, but for our difference. So when we compare two proportions, when the null hypothesis is that the two things are equal, which is kind of the state we're in, we run into a problem because there's no null value technically. Right? There's no P0 in a statement like that. We're just saying P1 is equal to P2. And you can rephrase it, and you can say that the difference between them is zero, and then you have a null hypothesis again, sort of. But again, it's a null hypothesis of zero, and it's hard to use that for anything interesting. Whereas in the single proportion case last week, we were doing things like testing P equals 0.4, P equals 0.9, P equals 88%, 0.88, things like that. We had numbers we could use. For this case, for the estimate of the difference between, we have no number. And remember last week, we carefully went through the two different ways you could compute the standard error. And there was, for the confidence interval, you sub in p hat. And for the hypothesis test, you sub in p naught. And they were different. And that was half an hour of me waving my hands trying to get you to realize that they were not the same thing. This week, we want to do the same thing. We've already talked about how you create the standard error for a confidence interval. But what about for a hypothesis test? We don't have a P0. What do we put in there? This leads us to sort of the last little bit of theory for the chapter, which is that we need to make one of these up. We need a fake P0 to put in for a hypothesis test on two proportions. And the way we do it, is we use what's called pooling. And so this gets us a new formula, which is the total proportion of success across the whole problem divided by the total number of observations across the whole problem. This is the proxy for hypothesis tests It's like P0 from last week. That's what it's used for. We don't have a P0, so we need to find something we can use. And this is the thing we've come up with. And so the formula is take all the successes in both of your sets and divide it by all of the, fail or sorry, all of the observations in both of your sets. Then once you've done that, and you've computed this, you'll notice this is called p hat. This is why you need subscripts. Because there's p hat, and there's p hat sub duke, and there's p hat sub usa, and there's p hat duke minus p hat usa. They are all different things, and you have to keep track of them somehow, or you're going to inevitably use the wrong one, and then the answer's wrong. So p hat on its own, with no subscripts, no other indicators for a two-proportion problem, is the pooled proportion estimate. And for about three or four problems on the assignment, you have to compute this guy. It's required. 
And if you don't, it'll just give you a wrong answer and you'll be very confused as to why it's wrong. It's because you're missing the concept of the pooling. So let's do this for our example from the GSS. Um, I have a formatting issue. <laughs> so let me just fix all of this for you. This is p hat Duke or p hat USA. And this is just the words pooled proportion. So calculate the estimated pooled proportion of Duke students and Americans who would be bothered a great deal by the melting of the northern ice cap. Which one is it closer to? So let's put it together. P hat, and you can give it a subscript. You can say P hat total or something or P hat pooled if you want to try and keep track of it just to help yourself. So this is the pool. Is the number of successes divided by the number of total observations. Grab a calculator, quickly compute that. So 454 plus 69 divided by 680 plus 105, liberal use of brackets, 0 0.66624. Which of the two is that closer to? Well, it's obviously bigger than the GSS, and it's closer to the Duke. Why is it closer to the Duke? Well, this is just how uh, sort of pooled averaging works is that it gets pulled toward whichever one gets weighted less, which is sort of strange. And so here, because the 454 over 680 is kind of the stable point, but when we add 69 over 105, we're actually pulling that up. And so it just ends up being closer to the one that has less samples. There's nothing really very deep about that. It's just kind of this is between the two. As a logic check, I love things where you can quickly stop and check your work and go, does this make any sense? It should be between the two numbers. If it's not, you made an arithmetic error. So if you get something that's bigger than the bigger one or smaller than the smaller one, you screwed up, stop, do it again. It has to be between the two or you did something wrong. So this is just actually the, uh, the math. I did it again. So 666 or 666 with the extra did decimals. And now we do a hypothesis test. So do these data, as given, suggest that the proportion of all the Duke students who would be bothered a great deal differs from the proportion of all Americans who do so? Calculate the test statistic and the p-value and interpret your conclusion in the context of the data provided. So it's the same as the confidence interval, same logic, but putting it together. So on the numerator, we have p hat Duke minus p hat USA. So this is our sample estimate or point estimate. This is our standard error. Notice what's different about the denominator versus the last question. Still a square root, still n1 and n2. What happened in the numerators of those fractions? They're not p hat Duke or p hat USA anymore. They're just p hat, the pooled estimate. And you use the same pooled estimate in both numerators. So look at that carefully, because screwing this up is going to be the cause of all of your heartache on the assignment as you struggle with it. When you're doing the hypothesis test, the numerators of the fractions in the standard error are the pooled p hat and 1 minus p hat. When you're doing a confidence interval, 
it's P1 and P2. So they're different just like they were last week. And you have to distinguish between which one is you're using. So we put in all the numbers. There's Duke, there's USA, there's 666 and 334, and 666 and 334, and 105 and 680. And by doing this carefully and working it through and getting the square root carefully, we end up with 0 0.011 divided by 0 0.0495, which is very close to what it was with the other formula. And that's normal, but it's subtly different, just enough. And we end up with a Z of 0.22. Now, how's your intuition coming? Before anything else happens, I mean, you can see the answer there with the p-value. But a 0.22 Z, do you expect that to be a reject or a fail to reject? Is that a big Z or a small Z? What are the kind of Zs we see on problems all the time? We see one and a half, two, three, four sometimes. Occasionally you get ones on the, uh, the web work where the randomization is just really wonky and you get like negative eight as your Zs. When do we reject? We reject when they're big, when they're far away from the middle and the middle zero. Point two two is not far away from the middle. So we're not out in the tail. We're not out in the reject region. We don't expect to reject this. You should always stop and look at that before you compute the P because it's a check on your own ability to compute the P to go, that's weird. I thought this was kind of a small Z, but my P is like really tiny and I'm going to reject. I probably did something wrong. This is our Z. Our P value is then two times the probability that Z is greater than that, which is that. Now, what would this be in R code? It's two times, now how do I find the area above 0.22? It's 1 minus the P norm of 0 0.22. Now, another thing that people have been sort of screwing up. Why did I do the area above 0.22? Why not the area below? What kind of tails are we dealing with here? What was the alternative hypothesis? The alternative hypothesis was not equal to, which means two tails. And you go in a two-tailed situation or a one-tailed situation, you go toward the closest applicable tail. So in a two-tailed situation, that just means you go toward the nearest endpoint. We are positive, so we go to the positive endpoint. So if you did a quick sketch, there's our point 22. We are going up because we go away from the middle. The only time we would ever go down would be as if we were in a lower tailed situation. And that can happen. But you go toward the closest tail if there's two of them or just toward the actual tail if there's one of them. That's the rule. So this gets us our answer. Is our p-value small? Very much not so. <laughs> this is a very, very large p-value. It is not remotely close to alpha. It's not 0 0.05, 0 0.02, 0 0.01. It's not really tiny. So we fail to reject it all. And so our conclusion statement is, we do not have evidence at the 95% confidence level to reject the null. And we cannot say that the proportions differ in a meaningfully way. They are the same, essentially, as far as we can tell. Which sort of makes sense, right? You wouldn't necessarily expect them to be that different. Although we will see an example at the end of the lecture today where they are quite different for an opinion survey. Let's recap the ideas before we do some more examples. When we are comparing two proportions, we start with the population difference, P1 minus P2. We estimate it using our point estimate, P1 hat, minus P2 hat. Once we have that, if we are checking our conditions to make sure that we can actually do a test, we need independence within the groups. So 10% sample max, independent sampling. This is just saying randomness. We also need independence between the groups. And we need at least 10 successes and 10 failures. 
Note again, and I'm just kind of harping on this, if any of these fail, you can still do the permutation test that we taught you first. That's the more general method. It works on essentially everything. And I hope if you take nothing else away from this course, you remember that so that when you hit fourth year and you have a tiny sample from your silly little experiment that you ran for your honors thesis, which you know could be done by, a, by a, your prof in like half an hour, but it took you four weeks because you're you know an amateur, I hope you remember that if your data don't meet the conditions, it doesn't mean you're stuck. You can still always do the permutation test. And that is why we taught it to you first. It is the most powerful, most general method. So even if all of the approximations fail, you can still do a permutation test. You can still get an estimation of significance. So please just try and remember that so that in three years when you come talk to me about your honors thesis and why it's not working, I don't have to be like, so do you remember what we learned? And you're like, no, no, I don't. Honestly, I don't. And then I have to teach it to you again. Try and remember it. Pooled standard errors. We do this. When we are doing the standard error for a confidence interval, you use the two piece. P1 hat goes in for P1. P2 hat goes in for P2. If you are doing a hypothesis test, you use p-pool. Now that is only in the case where p1 equals p2 is your null. Otherwise, and this otherwise means, for example, something like a null hypothesis that is p1 minus p2 equals 0.4. If you have a statement like that, that's P0. And then you're back to last week, and you just use that as your number. But uh, if you have the standard null hypothesis for these differences, which is most of what we look at, then you have to pool them together to get your P hat, which goes into the hypothesis test. Uh, so as a reference for the standard error, um, we haven't really talked about what it means. Uh, it's very rare that we actually know sigma in any of these problems, and this will hold true for the entire course for second semester as well. Often you just simply do not know the population standard deviation. And so in those cases, you almost always just use this estimate that we're using, this standard error thing that's going on the bottom. There's, there's a little note in the book about it. It's not something we're emphasizing, so don't worry about it too much. But basically, just remember the fact we very rarely know the true variance. We just don't. It's just not something we know. It's not as if a tablet descends from on high and hands it to you and says, the variance is 3.2. You're like, no, it, I don't know that. And so we use an estimate in place of that. Note on uh, working with these. If doing a hypothesis test, the P always comes from the null. This was from last week. And if doing a confidence interval, use P hat. The same logic. So this is last week. And I just wanted to repeat this. The same logic applies again. If we're working with a hypothesis test, it comes from the null. When you don't see anything on the null, because we're doing an equal one, that should trigger one neuron to tell you, oh, yeah, right, I pool them instead. When you're working with the confidence intervals, you just full steam ahead, use P1 and P2. Just use your hat estimators, and off you go. OK, any questions about what we've done so far in the lecture? Yes? Yep. I'm just going back yeah. far enough to get there. Uh, you, you want the hypothesis test or the confidence no, interval? No, actually, my question is, how do we determine that we're putting P2 before the US? So that was the same question she had asked, and it's a good question. What, what order do you do? If you have an alternative that's two-tailed, it doesn't matter. If you have an alternative that's one-tailed, the question tells you. It says, Duke is more in favor of ice cap melting bad then Americans, you're like, okay, Dukes is supposed to be bigger, which means we'll do P Duke minus P USA and use an upper tailed test because we expect a positive difference. 
and you just you have to set it up based on the problem at hand. If it's two-tailed, it does not matter. You can do it either way. And it'll be the same conclusion at the end. You'll get different Zs. They'll be negative instead of positive. But it'll be the same conclusion. OK, let's do another example. So in 2010, Angus Reid, which is a polling agency, conducted a poll of Canadians, 1,005 of them, and found that 63% of them supported laws allowing for doctor-assisted suicide. In 2014, they did another survey of 1,504 of them and found that 79% of them supported laws allowing for doctor-assisted suicide. This was taken prior to the ruling on February 6th that opened the door to this happening. It was sort of a landmark finding by the Canadian Supreme Court and the repercussions haven't really been felt yet, but it actually it opened the door to uh, what was sort of quietly being done anyway, being legal because there are people who choose the, to end their own suffering. And that should be their right, and that's what the Supreme Court found, was that people have the right to choose how they want to die. And it was a fairly contentious case, and the politics have been pretty severe on it. But what we're interested in is, was that difference just chance, or had the public opinion actually shifted like that? And so we want to know whether that changed from 63 to 79 was chance or actual changes in public opinion and public morse and how people felt about it. You know, did, did the fact that there was a lot of discussion between 10 and 14 open people's eyes to what the actual con conditions were and what the concerns were and what the actual framework was talking about? I mean, because originally you asked people in 2010 and they had this like mental picture of like, evil parents having a doctor, you know, kill their child because they were just fed up with it and things. And it was, it, was, it was a little overblown, right? But it had this picture that, like, someone who was disabled, who couldn't give consent, could just be, you know, suicided, so to speak, by someone else. And there was a lot of concerns about that. I, you know, I, I was an adult by the time this happened, right? So I actually kind of was aware of it happening around me. And I don't know if you remember it. 2010 was long enough ago you were, what, 10 years old, 11 years old? So it wasn't really part of your life. But I remember people talking about it. And some of the, the things people were coming up with were very much in line with, with some of the news stories about gay marriage in the States, where they're like, it's a slippery slope. Pretty soon you're going to be marrying your refrigerator. And it's like, what? What are you saying? Like, like th that is not a good argument. Go take a philosophy class and learn how to argue. But some of the arguments here were the same. And so the question is, did all of the cases that were, were being held and the lead up to the Supreme Court case and all the newspaper articles. Did that kind of help people actually realize what the truth was and what, what, what they said was actually asking for? Because it's very rigorous. It's within a massive framework. And you can't just be like, doctor, I'm depressed, want a suicide. It doesn't work that way. It's a very long process, and it involves a psychological evaluation. And, and there's safety frameworks in there to prevent you from making a horrible mistake. And so when people realize that, did they change their mind? So that's the context of our question. And this is one of the things stats can do. And this, you know, this would be if you were coming from a sociology or a psychology point of view and you wanted to kind of examine public opinion on this, or even a medical point of view. If you're in a nursing class or a healthcare class, you could talk about this decision and how it influences the practice of medicine. So let's figure it out. It's a good question. First step, let's determine the values. All right, what do we have? It's all a word. From 1005 and 79% from 1504. Let's write these down. So we have 79% from 1504 and 63% from 1005. So if you're not given them, you have to write these things down. And obviously, be careful here, because making a mistake here makes the whole problem ridiculous. So you know, take your time. Make sure you read it right. Now that we have this, and we have these values, let's set up our hypotheses. But before we do that, we have to check. So this, these are large samples. Are all of these true? Yeah. We have over 1,000 samples. And the probabilities are 69 and or 64 and 79 percent. So clearly, 1,000 plus times that. All these numbers are greater than 10. 
We have at least 10 people who said, no, this is not a good thing, and at least 10 people who said yes in both surveys. So that was met. Do we have independent samples within them? That's the point of a polling agency is they do this. They try and actually randomly sample from the population, and they're quite careful about it. And there's a lot, of, a lot of stats involved in how they do it, so we're good there. And are those two sets independent? Yeah, they're four years apart, and they were sampled separately, and they were both done randomly from the overall Canadian population. So they don't have anything to do with one another, except that they both should represent Canada as a whole. So normality assumptions are met. That's what that means. When all of those hold, the hypothesis test can be done, and we can use the normal approximation, which makes our denominator valid. If any of those fail, the standard error formula stops working. That's why we check it, is just to make sure. And so our standard error formula, as we set it up there, is this way if we are doing a confidence interval, which is what we're going to do for our first pass. So are the differences between the two sample proportions due to chance, or did the proportion change? One or two tail? Why two? It doesn't say bigger, it doesn't say smaller, it doesn't say larger, it doesn't say you know, any other word which has to do with a relative size. It simply says change. This is a two-tailed test. And we're going to use the confidence interval method first. These are the possible hypotheses. So we have equal, not equal, equal less, equal greater. These can all have the same null, but this is the one we're going to be dealing with. Two-tailed because it says change. That's a two-tailed condition. What's our Z star? Well, we're going to do a 95% confidence interval. And this is 0.975 again. This is the same argument as 20 slides ago. Quick sketch. Two and a half. 95 Z star 0. 97.5%. And the equation will then be the point estimate plus or minus Z star times the standard error. Yes, question? Um, why are we doing the 95%? Why 95 versus not something else, you mean? Yeah. It didn't say. So we just go with that. The default position, if it doesn't say in any problem in this course, is that alpha is 0.05 and you're doing a 95% confidence interval or 95% hypothesis test. It is the default position you take if nothing else is specified. A lot of the times in the homework it is specified and they say use 96.7% confidence just to force you to think about it. You know, it's not, not like you'd ever do that in the real world, but it does force you to stop and actually do the work instead of just plugging in the number blindly. And so if it doesn't say, great question, 95 is your default. We now have our Z star, we need our point estimate, and we need our standard error. Let's figure both of those out. So these are P1 and P2. So our point estimate is going to be 0.63 minus 0.79. Why did I choose to do it that way? No particular reason. You could have done it the other way too. That's totally fine. So you could also I don't know why my zeros are turning into sixes today. You could do that as well. That would be totally fine. It does not matter which way you go. This is where you are making your mistakes. Given the number of questions I get on web work, personal messages and direct messages in the channel, and it almost always comes down to the fact that people can't do square roots, this is where you're going to make your mistakes. So take this part slow, and if you get the answer wrong, first assumption is you used the wrong formula. Second assumption is your standard error is probably wrong because that's what's happening. People are screwing this part up over and over again. So take it slow and careful and compute it really, really carefully. So why are we using P1 hat and P2 hat? Because it's a confidence interval. This is the formula for a confidence interval. If we were doing the whole hypothesis test Z, it would be different, but we're not. Put in the values, 63%, 1 minus 63%, 1,005 samples, 79%, 1 minus 79%, 1,504 samples. 
Compute those two numbers, 0 0.00023195 and 00011030059. Notice how I kept all the decimals. You should always do this. I know it's tedious, but if you start eliminating and rounding decimals in the earlier stages, by the time you've done the square root and then combine it together with the other thing, you end up rounding off on like the third decimal and that can make the web work answers wrong. If I was marking by hand, I'd be able to tell what you did, but we're not, we're using the web work. And so in that system, it's looking for often precision to those extra couple of decimals. So just keep eight decimals all the time right through to the very end. And you can actually dump an eight decimal answer into web work and it'll work just fine. You don't have to do the rounding ever as far as the homework goes. Just keep it all right to the end, copy paste off our plunk it in, nine decimals, great, done. And it's perfectly happy to evaluate your answer. Put those together. Take the square root of the answer, and we get our standard error as being 0 0.0185. I'm going to keep the 4999, though, for the combination into the confidence interval. Point estimate, plus or minus, Z star times the standard error. Negative 0.16. And I don't know what that is. 1.959964 times 0 0.0184999. Turns into, and at this point I do round, but only in the very final step, a confidence interval that runs from negative 0.196 to negative 0.124. So visualize that. If you can't visualize that, draw it. Here's zero. Here's the upper bound. Here's the lower bound. This is our confidence interval. Does our confidence interval include zero? What does that mean? Reject the null. They are not the same proportion. They are different. There was a change in public opinion. Does not include zero. We reject the null. We do have evidence at a 95% level to conclude that there was a change in public opinion concerning doctor-assisted suicide between the years 2010 and 2014. Now, you cannot say, even though it's very obvious from the data, that there was an increase because you didn't do the test to support that. You can just say that there was a change because we did a two-tailed test. If you want to be able to say that there was an increase, you should have set up the hypothesis that way in the first place. What if we did it the other way? You want to do the hypothesis test instead? So we do Z test is P1 hat minus P2 hat minus the null hypothesis value, if it exists, over the square root of P hat 1 minus P hat, P hat 1 minus P hat. These are not P1 and P2. These are the pooled estimate. We are doing a hypothesis test, so we use P hat, and we use, this, this should say N1, N2, not the four things together, because you still use N1 and N2 there, so we combine this by taking number of successes and number of successes divided by the total number of samples in both sets. So putting this together on the next slide, we have N is 2,509, which is this. So we have P hat being 7258 or 73%. Stop for a second. What's our logic check here to make sure we did it right? It needs to be between the two proportions from the data. Is this between the 60-something and the 79? Yes, it is. And so that is the probably correct. We can assume that we did it correct and move on to the next step. Put this all together. Here's the formula. We have P1 hat minus P2 hat over the square root of P hat 1 minus P hat over N1 plus p hat 1 minus p hat over n2. Carefully put together those fractions, then take the square root of the results, and you get negative 0 0.16 over 0 0.018175475. End result, negative 8.8. .8. Quick logic check. 
Is this a big Z? Yeah, it's a very big Z. So we are expecting to reject. We're expecting a tiny p value. Let's find out what we get. Question? So the, the formal formula for this is minus the null hypothesis if it exists. In this case, there is no p naught, or the null hypothesis is p1 minus p2 equals 0. And so it's this value. And so you can put it in. I'm just putting it in to kind of force you to think about the fact that once in a while, I can give you one of these problems where I say, is the difference between them equal to 4 or something? And then you have to actually be able to set it up and include that little bit there. Most of the time, we drop it. But sometimes it gets included, and it's important to remember that it does belong there. Answer your question? OK. Negative 8.8 .8 is a really, really big Z, like really big. So we're expecting a really, really small p. This is how I would do this if I was doing it in R. I gave you this so that you can use it on the assignment. Because you can copy paste this code off of my slide, because you all have my PDF, paste it into R, change the numbers, hit enter, and be done the problem. It's a way to speed up your work. Because you can copy paste this eight times for eight different hypotheses, change the numbers, and it'll work. It's also a way, and I do strongly encourage you to still do it yourself, by hand with a calculator just to practice, but it's a way to check your calculator work and go, did I do this right before I go putting it into web work and getting frustrated? And you're like, oh, it's the same, cool. And then it goes and off you, off you go. But this will take you all the way from your two yeses and ends right through to your computed Z. So if it is useful to you, great. And if it's not, I mean, you have to change this because I was dumb and this should say N1 and this should say N2. But other than that, it's good. P norm of Z. Why P norm of Z? Because it is a two-tailed test, and I am at negative 8.8, .8, so I go toward the closest tail. And how much area is there between negative 8.8 .8 and the closest tail? Um, a really, 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 really small number. That's 18 zeros, then a 6. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on. And then we get 6,5. It's zero. Within any sort of round off, it's zero. There is no p value there. So p is extremely small. And the conclusion from that is that we reject the null hypothesis. So with an extremely small p, we reject the null and conclude that there has been a change <coughs> excuse me, in public opinion concerning doctor-assisted suicide between the years 2010 and 2014. Which was fairly obvious from the naked eye, like we saw the 60 and the 79. It looked like it, but you can't trust your intuition because surveys are weird. Depending on how many people you survey, you can actually, you need to do the work and you actually have to do the test to determine whether you can trust your intuition. All right, I've got one more example to do, and then we'll wrap up for the day. So, uh, Final example is real time. So I'm going to do all this in real time. I don't have, most of the slides aren't filled out. Do people have different spending habits based on what kind of money you give them? So I take 89 undergrads, basically you folks, and I give you a choice of keeping the money that I gave you or buying a pack of gum or a pack of mints or something small. The claim is that money in large denominations is less likely to be spent relative to an equivalent amount in smaller denominations, test this claim at a 0.05 significance level using a test and a confidence interval. What kind of test are we going to do? Hypothesis, what's the alternative? We do have a statement of direction. This is a one-tailed test. You've got to set it up carefully. I'm not saying that they're different. I'm saying that one of them is less likely than the other. That's smaller. So I'm saying that money in large denominations, so this is P large, is less likely to be spent relative to an equivalent amount in smaller denominations, P hat small, 
And so I think that p hat large is going to be smaller than p hat small. The proportion of people who spend the money is going to be smaller among those who are given the larger denomination of coin or bill. Significance levels given. It is our traditional one, so we don't really have to think about it. 95%. So here's the data. I mean, it's sort of silly. It's a bit dated because, uh, I don't know, will, will a dollar even buy a pack of gum now? Like two, maybe two pieces of gum, like a stick of gum. But anyway, so, so it's a bit dated back when a dollar actually used to buy something. So group one, or I'm just, I just flip you a loony. Here you go. Have a loony, which means nothing, right? And loony's like throwaway change at this point. But, you know, you have a loony. Group two, you get four quarters. So are the people with the loony less likely to spend that loony because at least it's not four quarters in your pocket and you just desperately want your pocket to stop jingling? I mean, I don't even carry cash anymore. I don't know what you, you guys. Once Tim's got rid of the need for cash, so did my demand, desire to ever carry cash again. And once in a while, I carry it, and it's like, why do I have this money again? That's what cards are for. You know, uh, like debit and credit card transactions as a penetration among the Canadian consumer market are insanely high compared to places like the States. I don't, have, have any of you traveled to the southern United States even recently? It's very weird down there. Like, you'll have places that only take cash. And you're like, cash? Really? Like, that's, like, like not credit? Like, what? Debit? What's debit? Like, in Canada, pretty much everyone, even farmers markets have little stripe machines and will take your card now. Because cash, like, who carries around stacks of 20s with them? Like, you're just going to lose it. So, anyway, here's the context, here's the data. I have 12 out of 46 in the loony group and 27 out of 43 in the quarters group. So I need my P hats. This is our test. The null hypothesis is that the two proportions are the same. The alternative is that P1, which is large, is less than P2, which is small. And these are denominations. All right, blank sheet. Let's get started. First thing we have to do is compute these things. Twelve over forty-six and twenty-seven over forty-three. Let's move those to the next slide. Twelve over forty-six and twenty-seven over forty-three. So, calculator comes out, 0 0.2609, and 27 over 43, 0.6279. I want to do a hypothesis test and a confidence interval, which means I need two different standard errors. Let's divide my sheet. For the hypothesis test, my standard error is going to be to use p hat, which I do not have. So I need this. Let's pool the successes and the totals. 12 and 27 were my successes, and 46 and 43 were my totals. So 12 plus 27 is 39. And 46 and 43 are 89. 0 0.4382. Stop and check. Is that between the other two? Yes, I probably did it right. At least I didn't make a horrible, horrible error in some way. I'm going to proceed and use this now. My standard error under hypothesis test uses this guy. So I bring this over and I put it times 1 minus it over n1 plus the same thing but over n2. So I have 0 0.4382 and 1 minus that is 0 0.5618 over 46 plus 0 0.4382 times 0 0.56 so on over 43. 
this is the point you're going to screw up. This is the point where you are most likely to make a mistake. Go really slow here, really careful, put it together. 0.4382 times 0.5618 over 46 is a really small number. 0 0.00053. One seven six point four three eight two times point five six one eight divided by forty three is another small number five seven two five one. Add these together. I think I did it wrong because I got something crazy. Ah, sorry. That's what I did wrong. These only have two zeros. My calculator kept track of that. I did not. Take the square root of this answer, and we get 0 0.10522. We've done our standard error. Our hypothesis test is to combine the difference in our proportions with that standard error to obtain our z. Let's go to the next slide. So SE is 0 0.1052, P1 hat is 2609, and P2 hat is 6279. Put this all together, Z equals, now we have to be careful here, which direction do we go in? So let's go back to our statement of our hypothesis. Here's our thing, equality and P1 is less than P2. That's the test we want to do. Which means if we do P1 minus P2, we're doing a lower tailed test because we'll have a small number minus a big number, which should be negative. If we do P2 minus P1, we're doing an upper tailed test. So in this case, P1 hat minus P2 hat gives us a lower tailed version. And P2 hat minus P1 hat gives us the upper tailed version. So the order absolutely matters. And you have to decide which one you're doing ahead of time and stick with it. So let's go with this guy. We're going to do P1 hat minus P2 hat, and we're going to do the lower tailed test. So our rejection region is down in the lower tail. One tailed, lower tailed test. Question? Um, what does, is the lower tail and the direction What do you mean by the direction? Yes, so what, yeah, I, I think I understand what you're saying. So in this case, with the lower tailed version, the rejection region is down here. In the upper tailed version, the rejection region is up there, and those are the tails. So an upper tail is to the right, and a lower tail is to the left. Okay, P1 hat minus P2 hat. Over the standard error, computed with P hat only, which is what this guy is. Put this together, 0 0.2609 minus 0 0.6279 divided by 0 0.1052. Calculator work again. Negative 3.5 approximately. Is this a big Z? Reasonably. 
Yep, it's much bigger than 1.96, which is our 95% point. So we, we expect it to be even further out in the tail than 95% normally would be, which means we expect that we're probably going to reject now. So we want to now compute the P value. Let's move it over to the next slide. That's our Z. Quickly sketch a picture so we have an idea of what's going on. There's zero. There's negative 3.4886. That's the P value we want. We would call P norm of negative 3.4886. Why do I do P norm? Because P norm goes to the left, and that's where that filled in area is. And if I do that, I get something around that value. And if you plug it into R, you'll get a slightly different but very similar number. Is that a small p? Very small. Much smaller than 0.05. Therefore, since p is less than 0 0.05, we do have evidence at the 95% level to conclude P1 is less than P2. In other words, the kids who were handed the loony were less likely to spend that loony than the kids who were handed four quarters. And I can certainly see that in my own life. Anytime I have a pocket full of change for whatever reason, I usually just spend it on something random just to get it out of my pocket because I'm tired of having it jingling around. All right, as I said, assignment number eight is Extended till Monday. Have a wonderful week.